live from the theatermaker.ie studio at Axis Ballymun. On tonight's episode of Stage Door Live, we'll be hitting the hot topics with Maisie Lee and Colin Murphy. I will then be joined by Emmett Kerwin to chat about his work as part of Transform Associate Artist Scheme with Mermaid Arts Centre. And finally, our panel will be completed by Leon Bell and Julie Kelleher for the big debate on creating new work. This is Stage Door Live, live for the 28th of July, 2021. On tonight's episode of Stage Door Live, It's a mixture of things. So, um, what we're doing with Gave me a bit of time, gave me a bit of space, I think, I think. And keeping Which is crucial to our identity. Our identity. Our identity. Welcome to Stage Door Live. I'm Janice Debroyha. Thanks to the support of Axis Ballymun and Dublin City Council, we're broadcasting from the theatermaker.ie studio at Axis Ballymun, part of the Axis Media Hub. We've got a great show for you tonight, but before all of that, let's take a look at the top news stories from Blue and Michael at Irish Theatre this week. Take it away, folks. There's plenty of busy news for this week, so let's jump right in with the breaking stories. Indoor hospitality. Indoor hospitality returned last Monday after being closed since Christmas. Businesses will be expected to enforce strict guidelines. Contact details were to be taken from each adult, but this guideline has since been removed. Employees will only need to take details of one adult from each group. Each entrance must be staffed at all times to ensure customers do not go in unchecked. Some establishments will stick with outdoor dining for the meanwhile, only due to lack of vaccinations for staff or simply not having enough numbers. Panty Bliss received criticism on Twitter after announcing Panty Bar would not be opening indoors due to staff not yet being fully vaccinated. Calls for Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban's far-right government to resign intensified this week in the wake of the Peg Pegasus revelations. The Pegasus revelations showed that the government was using spyware to target journalists, media owners and opposition political figures. The allegations were published by The Guardian last week and were backed up by a number of cases with forensic analysis of mobile devices carried out by Amnesty International. This showed phones had been infected with Pegasus, which was sold by the Israeli company NSO Group. On Monday evening, a protest against the government over the Pegasus affair drew about 1,000 people Anna Donat of the opposition party called for the resignation of the government, stating that the rule of no law can no longer be trusted in Hungary. Last week, Orban announced that he would hold a referendum on child protection, involving a set of leading questions about sex education and gender reassignment, and what is being seen as an attempt to sow division and rally the conservative base into a culture war on LGBT plus issues. Today, Minister Martin, uh, to, uh, announced funding of 500,000 6, 6, euro through Culture Ireland for promotion of Irish arts globally this year and next year. The funding is to support 56 projects presenting Irish dance, film, literature, music and theatre and the visual arts worldwide. You can view the full list of June 2021 grant recipients on Culture Ireland's website, cultureireland.ie. is adamant that schools can reopen in September despite the threat of the Delta variant. Thánis de Leo Radker said yesterday that falling case numbers in Scotland, the Netherlands and England give us confidence that we can withstand the Delta wave without having to reimpose restrictions. The Minister for Education, Norma Foley, wanted to reassure parents and guardians that plans are in place to support the full reopening of schools in time for the start of the new school year at the end of August 2021. More than 80% of people in Ireland have taken their first dose of the vaccine, whereas just over 60% have been inoculated with both doses. More than 70% of adults are now fully vaccinated in the state, with 85% being partially vaccinated. This comes with news that the national vaccine rollout is to be extended with booster shots offered to the elderly and vulnerable populations. The Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, has said that children at high risk of serious illnesses from COVID-19 will be prioritised in the next stage of the vaccine rollout. This is coming after advice from the National Immunisation Advisory Commission to extend the vaccination to the younger cohort. 
The European Medicines Agency announced in May that the Pfizer vaccine would be safe to administer for children 12 and up and that the benefits far outweigh the risks. Furthermore, the booster shots for adults will be made available alongside the winter flu vaccine program beginning in September. It will be available for residents of long-term care facilities, frontline care workers, people aged 80 and over, and those who are immunocompromised. We are so excited to announce the Playboy of the Western World, the musical, is touring. If you are one of the lucky ones to see the adaptation on the stage of the Town Hall Theatre Galway, you'll no doubt remember its charming reimagining as a radio play. It will then be travelling to uh, next month to Dublin, Kerry and back to Galway. This outdoor tent performance is sure to be one of the central cultural highlights of the summer months. Adapted by Dermot de Fritja and Justin McCarthy, with music also by Justin and directed by Hilary Kavanagh, the Playboy of, of the Western World, the musical, boasts a full band, two Foley artists with vintage style sound effects, including half doors, jugs of water and a manual wind up wind machine. For more information on location, dates and tickets, check out the website playboythemusical.ie. Yesterday saw an Irish phantom grace the stage of Her Majesty's Theatre of the West End London. Killian Donnelly tweeted that the title track blasted out and the audience screamed the house down. Twitter images? We... Uh, Killian Donnelly posted a photo thanking his father at, for the Cullum Wilkinson CD he gave him, which inspired him at, at age 11. Following a very positive response and sold out shows, the inaugural walkabout show Bloody Phoenix will return for two weeks only to Phoenix Park. Beginning Wednesday the 4th of August, the show will run until Saturday the 14th of August. Note, there is no show between Wednesday the 11th, but there will be an extra performance instead on Tuesday the 10th of August. Dublin Fringe Festival announced its 2021 programme last week with over 160 performances of 30 events across 16 venues. This year's festival may not boast the 30,000 spectators it has in previous years, but its, amb its ambitions remain. Showcase the fabric of what makes Dublin unique and express the cultural identity of contemporary Ireland. The festival will run from the 11th to the 26th of September. You can check out the full programme on the official Fringe website, or you can see our top picks on their theatermaker.ie website. An entire sound team walked out on an outdoor performance of Row at Williamstown Theatre Festival's outdoor season. After rehearsing the outdoor piece in the rain, only stopping for thunder, it was set to be performed to the public for the first time on the 14th of July. That day it rained increasingly hard to the point where the sound and present creative crew agreed to walk out. The festival released an announcement that said this performance was cancelled as a result of continued inclement weather during the process leading up to the scheduled performance, not as a result of strike. Row, a musical recounting how Tori Murden McClure became the first woman to row across the Atlantic, was initially programmed for the Williamstown Theatre Festival's 2020 season. Actors' Equity, the US labour union that represents more than 51,000 professional actors and stage managers, announced last Wednesday that it is expanding eligibility for union membership. More on this later with Janice. Andrew Lloyd Webber's Drury Lane Theatre reopened last Friday after a two-year restoration project. The restoration, which cost £60 million, will allow the theatre to be open all day, not just for performances. The composer cancelled yesterday's official opening of Frozen, the musical, following nearly a month of previews, after a cast member tested positive for COVID-19. The rules around self-isolation for the rest of the cast, who all tested negative, meant the musical could not open as planned that day and is now set to open on Friday the 27th of August. The second of the Project Arts Centre's Whip It Up series is now in place. Whip It Up invited two artists to use the Project Arts Centre's billboard to call out social injustice, inviting artists to engage publicly with the issues and questions surrounding society today. The first was Fortune Lago's Blue Scale, a commentary on the people who say they are blind to race. 
The second piece is by Anya O'Hara, by inviting art venues to consult her on the accessibility of their buildings. Anya O'Hara is a theatre maker creating vulnerable work creating vulnerable work for and about people who are often left out of traditional arts and theatre spaces. Her long-term ambitions include demanding adequate access to theatre and arts for the disabled and marginalised communities through the creation of large-scale ambitious works as well as the continuation of community building projects like Chronic Chats, a creative and social group for chronically ill people. Be sure to make it to the Project Arts Centre to see it. The art will be in place for five weeks. The Keys Festival is starting this week, Wednesday the 4th of August. Established in 2017, the festival has hosted acts like the Murder Capital and Pillow Queens over its short tenure, and thanks to crucial funding from the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Grailduct, Sport and Media, they can now continue to showcase many great acts. The festival will host 16 shows over 16 nights over the month of August and will take place in four venues, the Workmen's Club, the Sound House, Chine, and the Grand Social, with final lineups and dates to be announced shortly. Following government guidelines, organisers hope to sell tickets for the festival shows, but if not, all shows will be streamed. The Irish-Polish drama I Never Cry was released in Irish and UK cinemas last Friday. It's available to watch in the Irish Film Institute and in the Lighthouse Cinema. It also it tells the story of 17-year-old Ola, whose father dies in a building site in Ireland, she must, and she must travel back there to bring his remains back to Poland. Ola also plans to retrieve the money that her dad promised her so that she could buy a car for her 18th birthday. While dealing with the foreign bureaucracy, the young woman comes to realise that she is, in fact, more interested in getting to know who her father really was than anything else. The film was a recent winner of the Grand Prix and Cine Europo Award at Mons International Film Festival. The recent announcement that the government will press ahead with their plans for reducing the pandemic unemployment payment has affected the country's music sector. I had a chance to interview Matt McGranigan of the Music and Entertainment Association in Ireland and Dublin South West TD Paul Murphy of People Before Profit about their thoughts on the upcoming changes. You can read all about it on theatremaker.ie. Juncture, a place where things join, is an exhibition that brings together the artwork of a group of palace workers and volunteers. Each artist with their own distinctive practice and experience of the palace space come together to create a multifaceted entity contained in the shared common space. The show also marks the return of a physical exhibition making for many of the artists. Months of the continuous lockdowns have inhibited the use of essential spaces such as studios, galleries and workshops. The show facilitates the return of a seemingly disparate group to run to their, to their common haunts. It will return on Wednesday and the 4th of August until the 7th. Reminder that the Arts Council's Project Awards opened last week. The deadline for all Project Award applications is the 19th of August. Yesterday, the Arts Centre funding and partnership funding also opened. The purpose of Arts Centre funding is to invest in and support the infrastructure of arts centres required to sustain and develop the arts in Ireland. Arts centres are defined as full-time, public-facing, professionally managed, building-based arts organisations. The purpose of partnership funding is to invest in and support the essential infrastructure required to sustain and develop the arts in Ireland. Further information for all these and more is available on the Arts Council's website. This is Pop Baby is calling on professional playwrights and theatre writers to fill out a short questionnaire to guide the creation of the Playwright Sessions. The Playwright Sessions is a year-long series and of masterclasses and talk shops featuring guest playwriting and theatre industry experts. These sessions will be designed to be responsive to their needs. The first session takes place online in October of this year. The playwright sessions are open to professional playwrights and theatre writers working on the island of Ireland and the Irish diaspora working professionally abroad. Dance Ireland currently has an open call, producing dance one-to-one. -one. Deadline for applications is noon, Friday the 6th of August. This opportunity is open to dancers who are Dance Ireland members. Producers can also apply, though they do not need to be Dance Ireland members. And today we'd like to dedicate our show to the incredible life of Ray McBride. Yesterday, sadly, Galway actor Ray McBride passed away after a long illness. In Galway, at the performance of In Middletown on the gate truck, Michael Murphy asked audience members for a round of applause in Ray's honour. A man of Clada and Bohermore, he was talented in many things. Ray was well known for his work as an actor with Druid, his dancing, his humour and was a talented runner. He was friendly and enjoyed attending the theatre. 
Never one to shy away from the truth, he'd tell you at intervals for everyone to hear if he didn't like a play. They say in Galway that you knew you made it <laughs> when Ray brought a card to your show. A statement was released yesterday on the President of Ireland's website as well as Druid's website. President Michael D. Higgins said Ray McBride will be remembered for his contributions to theatre, Irish dance and for the gift of his friendship and wit. As always, we want to hear from you. What news items did we miss? What do you want to hear more about? Send us your press releases and suggestions to news at theatermaker.ie or drop into our DMs on social media. If you find value in Stage Door Live, please help us grow by letting your friends and followers know. If you're watching on Facebook, hit that follow button and give us a like. Take a moment to share this live feed with your friends and followers right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and click that bell to keep updated on our new and exclusive YouTube content. Your support helps us continue these important conversations about Irish theatre now and into the future. Tonight marks our 30th episode of Stage Door Live, and we honestly can't believe it. A big thank you to everyone who has supported us from the very beginning and each step along the way. If you like what we're doing and want to show us some love, there are plenty of ways to do so. You can become a patron of Theatre Maker on Patreon, or check out our store, which is filled with loads of Osquelga products, all proceeds going directly to support the work we're doing here. So please do consider uh, buying some of our merch or becoming a patron. We're posting a link in chat now and it will also be in the description after the show. If you find value in Stage Door Live, now it's time for us to delve into this week's hot topics. Every week we invite two guests to join me in picking through the latest theatre and arts sector headlines. The good, the bad and the downright grisly. Don't forget, as we thrall through the headlines, we want to hear from you watching at home. So please be sure to pop your thoughts in the comments below. Allow me to introduce our first two guests on today's show. Theatre director Maisie Lee and writer Colin Murphy. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi, Janice. Thank Hi, you. Janice. Great to have you both with us. So without further ado, let's delve in. So the first topic that we'd like to talk about is uh, Minister Boyd Barrett slamming buyout contracts vocally in the doll. So early yesterday morning, Irish Equity tweeted a video of TD Richard Boyd Barrett condemning the prevalence of buyout contracts for Irish actors, particularly in the film industry, during Taoiseach's questions in the Dáil last week. Let's take a look at what he had to say. In the area of arts, of film, uh, cultural workers and so on, where there's a distinct lack of good work, sometimes legally required under things like Section 481 film relief, where there's a legal requirement for quality employment, uh, but Nesk point out it's not defined. Performers, I pointed out with you on the Enchanted film, you have this uh, phenomenon now of buy-out contracts, where producers say you will only get a job, this is for actors and performers, you only get a job on our film if, we, if you agree to sell off your rights to what are called residuals, royalties on future uh, performers performances uh, of that movie or f uh, film, okay? Something that all, uh, actors and performers used to enjoy and now producers are saying, you don't, get, you don't get to work for us unless you agree to a buyout contract. And of course the artists or performers want a job so they go, okay, well, I better accept that, right? It's absolutely wrong. Those, those buyout contracts shouldn't be allowed. Macklin subsequently retweeted the video with the caption, when you explain buyout contracts to someone from another industry at a party and they get incensed on your behalf. And certainly there's no question that Minister Boyd Barrett was incredibly incensed there in that video. So let's have a quick chat about this. So Maisie, do you have you any idea what the reality of these buyout contracts are for actors? I mean, I, I feel I'm probably not the best qualified to answer that because I'm not an actor and I don't work in film, but I do have a lot of friends and colleagues mm -hmm. who do. And I know, I know that, you know, 
they often talk about the good old days where you would, you know, the checks would be landing in the door uh, for every time something came back on and that that just doesn't seem to happen anymore. Um, and I think, you know, it's great to have someone with the passion of Richard Boyd Barrett to, to bring these kind of things to the to the fore and to, to talk about them because I think we do exist in a bit of a bubble sometimes and so just to have, have people with profile talking about these things is great. Certainly. And what about you, Colin? Is this something that you've come across yourself or are you aware of friends or colleagues who have um, been involved in this kind of thing? Yeah, so I, th I think residuals are, are kind of the equivalent of royalties. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a, a writer expects to get uh, a percentage of the of, of, of the um, the earnings of a, of a show. And if the show is subsequently sold on or something, you'd expect to get to get something from that down the line and residuals i think are, are, are similar and they were long established in the system the, the difference you know looking at it from a producer's point of view is that there's normally one writer or maybe a couple of writers mm -hmm. there could be a, a huge amount of of performers and so if you're dealing with administrating uh, residuals over the lifetime of um of of, of, of a screen production and that can now have many lives um online in different outlets it is complicated. So I, I don't know, Richard, I mean, Richard's performance there was fantastic and he's a terrific champion um, of, of arts workers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's right that buyouts should be banned. Uh, I'd be more inclined to think that, well, a, a, like a buyout might be a good idea if the buyout is good enough. Um, so in certain circumstances, you know, I might be as a writer, I might be prepared to consider a buyout because I might recognize that whatever the project is, um, that you know, the ongoing administration involved in, in royalties of the future just might not be uh, particularly workable. So if, if, but if the, if the lump sum, if you like, if the fee up front is good enough, then it might be in my interests. And I, th I think the real problem underlying this is probably that the workers he's talking about aren't getting paid enough up front. So it, they're, they're it, it, ultimately, it, I mean, it, it's about. I think it's, it's not so much about about um, income versus residuals, it's about how much are you getting paid, um, and uh, if 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 the if the income is is low and there's a buyout. Uh, that's that's a double jeopardy uh, and something's going to be done about it. Yes, you make some excellent points there that where you're dealing with one director or one writer or whatever uh, compared to potentially a cast of thousands, certainly kind of trying to keep track of a cast, is you know, the likes of Disney films like The Enchanted, there's presumably thousands of extras involved in that and the sheer administration of that would be a nightmare. However, just to bring it back to theatre, is this something that may become more prevalent in our industry? I know there is uh, rumblings happening in the likes of the National Theatre in London at the moment around this, where work that has been filmed on stage in theatres is now being broadcast online or in a digital platform. And I know that there's kind of rumblings happening. Do we think this is going to become an issue for those of us in the theatre industry? Maisie, I'll come back to you. Yeah, I definitely think it's opened up a whole whole can of worms. Um, that is just something that we hadn't thought about. You know, filmed theatre or hybrid that form that we're now kind of creating is is very new. And I think initially, you know, there was this rush of putting things up online straight away without necessarily thinking through all those logistics about longevity and how long they're going to be up and you know royalties and that type of thing. Whereas I feel like you know, we're far enough into this now that people have started to talk about those things and there are, I know Theatre Forum have, have had some recommendations um, done around that and I think, you know, just the, you know, the legal aspect is something that I think producers are going to have to think about and and definitely kind of, I think, um, defining how long something is online for, that you can't just put something online indefinitely anymore, you know, that maybe people did think they could early on in the pandemic when we hadn't thought through the repercussions of all of that. Absolutely. And Colin, I'm going to come back to you. Do you think there is a, a role or a responsibility on the part of government for legislating for this kind of thing? Yeah, there, there could well be. I mean, in the first place, um, there's a responsibility on the industry bodies uh, and the unions um, to, to to pull the information together and 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 to represent on it. Um, and I think one of the strengths of the theatre sector, and perhaps in contrast with the film sector, <clears throat> is that there's great solidarity. There's there's, there's very strong industry-wide solidarity as as uh, 
uh, emblematic in the National Campaign for the Arts. Um, I, I, but the difference is, I think, is that nobody in theatre makes real money in Ireland. Every, you know, everybody is doing it with almost a bit of a voluntarist ethos, ethos. Even those who are making a living, it's 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 it's, it's a modest living. Whereas in film, <clears throat> there is that the, the top end people make real money, um, and you know, those of us who aren't producers tend to think the producers are coining it, and of course, most producers are only uh, just about getting by as well. Um, but but nonetheless, that 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 fact of money uh, makes for a a, um, a, a factionalizing. Of, of of the sector, so I think it's it may be the case that kind of low paid workers in film are almost more vulnerable because um, uh, uh, it's in the interests of those uh, at the top to keep wages low. Whereas I think in in in, in theatre there's a little more solidarity uh, and and empathy and insight across the sector. Absolutely, and. Do you think then, as we're moving into this world now where a lot of digital platforms are being created and there's subscriptions, I know um, NT National Theatre in London ha now has a subscription service for their plays, this is going to be an issue that's only going to grow legs. Do we think that it's a global issue or is it an Irish issue or how, how should these conversations be happening, do you think, Maisie? I think it probably is a global issue in that, you know, people all over the world have been having to resort to online performance as, you know, there hasn't been any other option. Um, but I think we also need to look very specifically at our industry and how our industry works because, you know, within every country, industries would work differently. Um, so I imagine it's about looking to what other countries are doing and looking, trying to find a best practice example and then starting to adopt that. And I, I'm sure that that's, that's already beginning to happen. And I know, you know, agents and, and unions and things are also uh, beginning to look at all those things. So I think it's a process. We're still kind of in the middle of it. It's all still quite new, but but it's hopefully, you know, we're, we're learning as we go and things will become kind of clearer and clearer as I don't think this is going away. It feels like mm -hmm. the, the um, online streaming, as you say, is in, so, in certain forms will probably stay even once we're back to, to more live performance as we'd all like to be in some way shape or form so it's definitely something that needs to be fully investigated absolutely and i think as you said this is something that's only going to grow legs and get bigger i think there's no turning back now in this new world that's been created so moving on to our second not entirely unrelated in a way topic with this is about the actors equity in the u.s expanding their eligibility so Actors Equity, the US labor union that represents more than 51,000 professional actors and stage managers, announced last Wednesday that it is expanding eligibility for union membership. The new open access membership policy allows any theatre worker who can demonstrate that they have worked professionally as an actor or stage manager can now join the union. Previously, eligibility for union membership was only open to those working for an equity employer, giving all the power to employers rather than employees. They are also inviting former members of equity to rejoin the union without having to secure a new equity contract, which was required under previous policy. I wanted to talk a little bit about this as we've had some restructuring and expansion with equity here too, and of course the founding of Praxis, which is ongoing. Are unions, do you, do you think, catching up with a more modern way of making work? I'll come to you first, Colin. Look, it's been an incredibly difficult time for unions in the past, I don't know how long the trends go back, but certainly sort of 20, 20 years. I think they're probably quite strong still when I came out of college in, in the late 90s um, and, and unions across the board now are much, much weaker. Um, and in general, that's very bad for workers mm -hmm. um, and, and and not good for our politics or, or, or the health of democracy, I think. Having said that, I think a lot of unions have been very slow to keep up with, um, uh, with you know, changing work practices, changing economy, changing technology, um, and some of which is incredibly exciting, and, and particularly in our sector, which is incredibly creative um, and, and innovative. Um, so, you know, like speaking to broad principles, because I'm not an actor, and therefore I'm, I, I, I'm not in the actors' unions, but 
I, I mean, I think unions are a good thing, and I think it's really important um, that all workers, whatever your sector is, identifies the a you know a union for you and and, and joins it, and, and helps to influence um, its policy. And I think it's great then that therefore as well that unions, which which can in the past have been very restrictive gatekeepers, are also um, opening their doors. But of course, one of the reasons they need to do so is because they've been losing membership. Um, and they haven't, you know, like we're talking about the gig economy here, whether it's whether it's acting, whether it's writing, um, whether it's um, citing a bicycle delivering pizza, it's the gig economy. And um, it has been in the interests of employers uh, that workers aren't unionized, but too many workers have not seen it in their interests uh, to unionize. So there's a bit of both sides. So I think broadly, this can only be a good thing. Absolutely. Maisie, do you think, a kind of on a similar point, do you think that there's a much needed revolution in a way happening within um, the arts in terms of speaking out as to what unions should be doing for them? Yeah, it does feel that just recently in the last kind of six months or so, there's been a bit of a, a sea change of the unions with the arrival of Praxis, Praxis sorry, the artist union, um, which um, feels very broad in terms of the way it represents artists and it, the way it defines artists, which is great. Um, and also then within equity, um, I know there was some dissatisfaction at a deal that equity had um, struck. Um, I'm not a member myself, but I have friends again and active friends who are, and that this led to uh, a new executive coming in, and I believe the deal was overturned, and you know that this has led to a kind of new era in equity as well, which um, people seem to be, you know, pretty happy with. Um, so you know, now that there's the two unions, and both seem to be pursuing new directions, um, you know, obviously not everyone is eligible to be a member of both or either, you know, but I think for what they're doing, it seems definitely that things are changing. So Colin, do you think, uh, kind of just touching on what Maisie is saying there, that all of this kind of movement and restructuring, do you think that this is a positive step forward uh, for, for all of us in the arts? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, like it, broadly, unions are a good thing, but also I think competition within the union sector uh, can be a good thing. If you look at any other sector in Ireland, you know, there isn't just one union representing workers, workers have a choice. Um, and unions are democratic organisations in themselves and, 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 uh, and, and, and membership run. And, and so, um, you know, I think it's important that there is there, there, there is that choice and there is that therefore that kind of a bit of creative friction amongst them as well as, as solidarity between them. Definitely. And Maisie, we'll, we'll finish on this. Um, you kind of, you've both mentioned kind of dissatisfaction um, in, from certain quarters in terms of what equity was doing. Uh, do you think that currently there exists a lack of trust from members in the unions? And do you think that they're going to have, whether it's equity or praxis finds its feet, that they're going to have to work quite hard to earn uh, arts workers' trust to become members? I think it seems that there has been, um, but I feel like that's already starting to change. Um, I know people were, were very pleased with the outcome of the recent AGM um, for equity and the new uh, election of the new executive. So it feels like, you know, that that change has begun to happen. Praxis, you know, are now in existence, are already beginning to to work themselves. So, you know, I think I think they will have to work hard, but I think that seems like it's already beginning to happen. Excellent. Positive note. I like positive positivity in these times. Thank you, Maisie and Colin. Of course, they will be back with us later in the show for our final segment, The Big Debate. Thank you so much for those thoughts, both of you. <laughs> If you haven't checked out our website recently, you're missing out. You can catch up on our blog posts, our latest articles and Theatre Maker news at theatremaker.ie. While we transition to our next segment, the feature story, let's take a quick look at the program programming happening this week in Ireland and abroad. I'm Michal O'Connell and this is what's happening in Irish theatre this week. Michael Murphy's in Middletown opened last night in Galway with the sad news of Ray McBride's passing. Michael Murphy asked audiences to join him in a round of applause celebrating Ray's life in, in Middletown is touring on the specially adapted gay truck, an innovative construct for the time. Tomorrow they will perform in Glore Ennis. Next month they will visit Limerick, Port Leash, Longford, Letterkenny and Sligo until the 14th of August. 
All performances are sold out bar one at Kenny. Irish Rep New York is presenting the North American premiere of the Cordelia Dream by Marina Carr, one of Ireland's most well-known playwrights. Carr is the author of more than 20 published plays and has won numerous awards including the Irish Times Playwright Award. The Cordelia Dream was commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company and closed their 2008 season at the Wilton's Music Hall in London. A rehearsed reading was produced in November 2020 in Cork's Everyman Theatre. The show is being live streamed on irishrep.org at various US East Coast Standard Times until Sunday week, the 8th of August. Reservations are free but required to access this digital event. A donation is suggested for those who can afford to give. Produced by the Lyric Drama Studio, Dracula opened last night and is running through Sunday the 1st of August. Dracula will be recorded with a live audience for future broadcasts. Tickets and information are available at the Lyric's website. Get your VR headsets ready. Pan Pan, in association with La Mama Experimental Theatre Club, presents The First Bad Man, a performance in 360 based on a reading of Miranda July's novel of the same name. The two-part performance will be available to watch in 360 or to watch in 360 stereo using VR headsets. Performances will take place on the 30th and 31st of July, this Friday and Saturday. More information at panpantheatre.com. Needless to say, we're intrigued. And now for a few reminders of events still happening. Anna starts in association with the Lime Tree Theatre and Bell Table Art Hub's production of Waiting for Poirot is still running at the People's Park Limerick until, until this Sunday, the 1st of August. Tickets are sold out online, so we hope you're one of the lucky audience to experience this murder mystery in person. The West Cork Fit Up Theatre Festival runs until this Sunday, the 1st of August, with the opportunity to catch the remaining five shows in person at the Bally de Hob Community Centre. Audiences also have an opportunity to tune into a live stream of the festival on the 31st of July this Saturday. More information available at the Fit Up Festival's website. And that's all that's going on in Irish theatre this week. For this evening's feature story, I am delighted to introduce Emmett Kerwin. Emmett is an actor and playwright and is one of four artists selected for the Mermaid Arts Centre's Transform Scheme. This scheme is employing artists on a part-time basis at Mermaid for one year, not on a project or commission basis, but rather to proceed with their work in a self-directed fashion, except with less economic precarity than is normally the case with artists. Welcome to the show, Emmett. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. First of all, congratulations on being selected for his Transform. I've no doubt the competition was mighty. I, th I think so. I don't know. Well, I, I think there was a number of applicants, but uh, yeah, I wasn't, not that I wasn't thinking about it, but yeah, I'm sure there was. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's get right to it. What was your initial reaction when you first heard about this scheme? Um. It was kind of well i thought it'd be a godsend <laughs> to be honest um i was living in wicklow and uh i was living in wicklow for about like 14 months you know and i'd been here all the way through lockdown so it was incredibly uh isolated uh, i was writing and trying to get something done and um the one thing i'd missed i suppose i would be quite a social person but i'd always worked in um concert with other people to uh, bounce ideas off and talk to and just having that kind of human connection which you obviously had with friends but not necessarily professionally 
So the idea of actually being kind of plugged into an art center um, that was in Wicklow, that was close by, and with the people also that were uh, um, running uh, Mermaid was really appealing, you know. I can only imagine. So how did it feel to get the call that you were actually selected to be one of the four artists? It was like that, um, you know, that musical uh, chorus line, God, I hope I get it. I hope I get it. You know, <laughs> it was on the other end. And then we started <laughs> harmonizing. Uh, Amazing. It was, uh, yeah, Julie Raymond, I was like, you know, it was, it was really bowled over. I was just like, kind of, uh, I don't know, you know, little, no, more like Little Miss Sunshine, you know, when she gets the, the call basically saying she's going to be yeah. a beauty queen. And then I was kind of dancing around. Uh, Julie didn't know that, but I was really kind of. Uh, you didn't happen genuine. to record it, did you, on a webcam somewhere? No, no, no. no. Those moments are <laughs> ephemeral. They exist in that moment and then they're gone. That's yeah, it. absolutely. No one wants to see me dancing around. But I was, I was really, really excited. And, uh, and I, you know, yeah, I was just kind of over the moon because it was a big relief, actually. Uh, and because I think a lot of things about the, the, the pandemic there's not a lot of necessary light at the end of the tunnel, you know, that kind of way. So um, it was actually quite a highlight of the year and it was, it was quite, um, yeah, it was a lot of weight off. So I suppose there was a kind of relief of getting a phone call. There's, there's a lot to be said for having something that can open that valve of pressure a little bit, especially in the last year, there's been so much, as you said, darkness. So to have a little bit of light, I can only imagine how fantastic that felt. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. When it comes to the creation of new work, have you seen a change in the relationship between venues and, institu and institutions and artists since the start of your career to now, if at all? Definitely. I think kind of what was happening about 20 years ago, and there was a joke, you know, with the Arts Council that if there wasn't a theatre company in your county, start a theatre company and then you could apply for, you know, funding. Um, I remember Kildare didn't have one, and I think they kind of somebody started a company, you know, because every every kind of county had to have them. Um, the only kind of places about twenty years ago that were actually commissioning new work was the Abbey, um, and a number and Fish Amble and a number of large theatre companies like uh, um, Wolf Magic and Druid. And what's happened? A lot of the arts institutions that were built in the nineteen nineties and in the two thousands. And and this is usually the case: the ones that actually don't have the most amount of money that actually get the least amount of money in terms of the large institutions they have reached out to the local community embedded themselves in the local community and tried to seek out those new writers and create new work um uh, the every man as well when judy's down there like you know uh, mick flannery uh the musical and stuff that, that those guys did there's the other places that don't have the money of the abbey are putting on shows uh and, and actually, the inverse of that is that now the Abbey is not doing as many new plays as it was 20 years ago, but other play, places and companies with the very limited resources that they have are cobbling together the money to put on at least one or two uh, new pieces of work. And then there's also Project, you know, has Project Artists and each of the big companies are still doing maybe one new kind of commission, play commission a year. Fish Amble has always and has always been a leading light in new writing. But I think unfortunately in the last five years the slack of being a production house which usually fell on the abbey has kind of been left wanting and uh yeah hopefully now with the new the new regime that they will they'll start churning those new plays out because um you know the, 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 a lot of artists have to kind of make their own plays and put them on it's incredibly difficult as a writer uh to become also a producer and an actor and a flyer and a poster maker and you know run social media campaigns it's really lovely i think as a writer when somebody can produce a play for you and not enough young writers have that experience because um they're not being produced by big playhouses absolutely quite often um there there is that pressure as you say to, to to just make the work and having to wear all of the hats which is really hard do you find um in those instances emmett when they do happen that maybe your actual work suffers as a result because you're trying to think practically, think of the financials, promote the show and, and do all of that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, sometimes it can all, you can spin all the plates and it does all kind of pull off. Um, but arguably, you know, obviously the more time spent on something, the better it's going to be. Uh, and I think when you're younger, that kind of hustle is all part of it. It can be quite exciting. It can be quite fun, especially when you're doing a fringe show. And uh, but I think when there's a lot of moving parts and you really just have to concentrate on being a writer to get the play done, 
um, yeah, you know, it, it really does, it does help if somebody's there to, to do that heavy lifting for you, you know, and take that off your hands. So it's still there, still early days, obviously, with, with Transform. But would you envision that schemes like this could potentially transform how having artists in the building like yourself and the way that Transform is working, how their input could potentially change the ways in which institutions and venues produce or create work or, or even how the creative power flows in those places? I think so. I, well, I hope so. And I know that's what the uh, Transform scheme is, is aiming to do. Um, you know, we're there every week. We do uh, weekly meetings. So it's good for me even, you know, to see the, the how the institution works, that it's not just this kind of monolith that you kind of stand outside and go into every once in a while to visit and see shows and interact with only when you're working on a show in the place. So you get to see the kind of the day-to-day running of it. And I, I can't speak for everyone else, so I don't know exactly what kind of effect we will have on the institution, but I think it's kind of illuminating for everybody to see how the institution works, how everyone's department works, and then also to hear kind of weekly updates about our process and what we're up to. Um, you know, and it's good crack. It's one, one of the things is like, is uh, I, I remember when, when I was applying for it, it was just that actual human connection and hearing from other people and being tied to somewhere, being tethered essentially to the real world or to the arts world um, in a real tangible way uh, is good psychologically, artistically, and, uh, and it's just, yeah, good for the soul. Definitely, because I was just going to ask you that next is like quite often it can feel like those arts, in arts administration, like the, the people who are running these venues and institutions, it can feel a bit like they're up in their ivory towers. Whereas I suppose having yourself and other artists in the building, not only are you learning from the building, but they're actually getting a really good solid view of what it's like for you as artists. Th- yeah, like to be fair now, I think my experience is all the way through as a, as a theatre maker and as an actor with smaller theatre companies or um places like Axis and uh, Civic and uh, Mermaid, they've always been incredibly welcoming. And as I said, they're places that are, as a military expression, you know, forward operating bases yeah. of art within a community. And they embed themselves in the community. And the ones that are really incredibly successful, like Mermaid, like Axis, like the Civic, are the ones that the community knows about, they frequent, they use it for everything from um, dance classes to you know adult learning to uh, cafes you know it's it's a place it's a place that's a living breathing aspect of the community so those art centers that they build that were primarily built in the last 15 years I think have been incredibly successful at embedding themselves in the communities where they are based uh, and they they're a really important thing so I suppose probably an offhand comment when I said that there about that monolith kind of thing I was thinking about older institutions that have kind of been around for like another like 50 years, 100 years, they can kind of seem like, that. well, look, there's a way that we do things and this is how it is. Whereas um, all the new spaces are, they're fairly new, they're flight footed and they, 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 they learn and they work and they, they, they listen to the community that they're based in, you know? Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And that community connection is so important for feeding the future of theatre between makers and audiences. Um, planning long term isn't usually a gift afforded to artists. Um, you know, you're always working to a deadline. <laughs> so what kind of freedom and space does a year of support like this create in your life? Um, the thing, yeah, people, artists don't talk about money a lot. And uh, when younger artists are looking at other artists, like how do they, uh, how do they do it? And the, and the thing is, most of them don't do it, like do it successfully. And Colin kind of uh, was talking about that, you know, there's a volunteer aspect to the work that you're doing it rarely pays even when you're getting paid um so the actual financial relief of of having something that kind of does mirror ubi or universal basic income is an incredible relief um financially just you know and people don't talk about it enough because most artists like you know if there's a medical bill that comes in that's too much it can knock your whole world off uh the clutch falls out of your car you know and especially during covid everybody's money just disappeared, it just evaporated, you know what I mean? Even if you had the minor amount of savings. So that precarity that you exist in, um, that knife edge that most artists exist in, and um, when a, a system like this is arranged for them, and it's not just like UBI, 
you are expected there is a you know you are working and creating and making stuff and engaging all the time mm -hmm. um so it's not just a passive income you know there is an aspect where you are doing work and working um so just it's just a relief just not that kind of like you know um one, one kind of like thing can blow you off course you know absolutely and on that point that you've just made many people would consider you one of those individuals that has made it so to speak like a successful artist what do you say to that and what does that say about our parameters or expectations of success in this industry um one whatever you think my success is triple it you know i am incredibly successful and <laughs> uh no i'm it's weird it's kind of like if, if i often think if people think i'm successful i'm like uh, you know i yeah it, it's a mod it's a very moderate kind of form of success um uh, but like again you know it, it might i suppose visibility doesn't actually equal uh comfort and even though someone might hear your voice or see a play that you're making you're rarely actually paid enough to get yourself through and you always and this is the thing about all actors and artists and playwrights and um i'm quoting the great kind of uh, uh artist uh, jesse jones who's from my housing state where i grew up um she said everybody has a side hustle and what a lot of people don't do is the artist in order to kind of keep that verisimilitude of success going for the people to think that they're successful they don't really ever talk about all the other things that they have to do in order to just pay their bills so even though i am working and moderately successful i have about five or six other side hustles of jobs that i have to do uh constantly you know um teaching uh teaching writing teaching accents on films doing voiceovers recording books you know it's about seven or eight different jobs in order to kind of fund the one job that you have you know so um yeah yeah it's it's it's, it's quite you know it, you can be successful, but you will always kind of still be chasing that next job in order to kind of keep yourself going, you know? Certainly, it's one of the biggest open secrets in the entertainment industry that just because you're famous and people know your name does not mean you have a very large bank account, usually the opposite. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm what they call squint-eyed famous. You know, when people are walking down the street in Ireland, they kind of go, <laughs> and then they like, mm. and, or, or they'll go, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. It is, it is. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely. In my book, you're famous, Emmett. <laughs> For sure. Finally, I'm going to be a little bit cruel here and ask you to put into one sentence, wordsmith that you are, what the transform scheme means to you as an artist. I can see the cogs turning. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Pithiness is not my forte. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 um, what is it? Uh, a beautiful, uh, amazing, lovely experience that I, that I'm very excited and uh, honored to be a part of. <laughs> <laughs> that will do. <laughs> You'll think of something brilliant now at about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to come back to me for the joke writer for the Oscars with that one. Go. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Emmett. I could talk to you for hours, no uh, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But before we move on, could you tell our audience about any upcoming projects they can keep an eye out for and where they can find out more about you online? Yes. Uh, I'm doing a new play. I'm writing a new play at the moment called uh, Straight to Video. Um, it's going to be produced by Landmark Theatre Company and it will be on in the Civic in Tala and then six weeks in uh, in the Project Art Centre in October and uh, November. Tickets online, go get them now. Uh, and then I'm going to be working um, on another show that I'm currently writing uh, called Accents uh, with uh, Own French. Um, it was part of the court band Talos and that's going to be, uh, it's going to be a, a spoken word play with music um, based around the idea of accents and how they define people well how they were used essentially to define people in ireland uh, for a long time and still are and um how people think that there's a correlation between accent and intellect and about the history uh the anthropological kind of 
movement, I suppose, history of uh, peoples from city centres out into suburbs all over Ireland and uh, what, what your accent means about where you're from and who you are, uh, all accents in Ireland. So that's um, going to be on in Fringe 2023. And I'll be doing all that kind of uh, whilst I'm working uh, in the Mermaid as well. And, and get, you know, it's all part of it. That sounds so exciting. I'll definitely be buying tickets. Nobody else buy tickets. I want, I want to make sure I get one. Thank you so much, Emmett. We, of course, will be chatting to you in a little bit with the big debate. If you are interested in finding out more about the Mermaid Arts Centre and what they've got going on, please do check out their website, mermaidsartscentre.ie. They've got some great stuff programmed at the moment, and I would highly recommend you have a look. If you find value in Stage Door Live, please help us grow by letting your friends and followers know. If you're watching on Facebook, hit that follow button and give us a like. Take a moment to share this live feed with your friends and followers right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and click that bell to keep updated on our new and exclusive YouTube content. Creating live content is a costly endeavour. If you'd like to help us keep the conversations going, please hop on over to our Patreon page, where you can become a patron and gain access to exclusive patron-only content. Patreon.com forward slash theatermakerie. You can find us on most social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at theatermakerie. And catch additional news, blogs and sector coverage on our website, theatermaker.ie Watch this space. There's more exciting content on the way from theatermaker.ie For our final segment of the evening, we would like to welcome you to the big debate. In this segment, we will be inviting our guests to discuss, deliberate and debate on the bigger issues, questions and possibly even a few controversies that are currently on the teacups. I would like to welcome to the panel artist and arts manager, Leon Bell, and artistic director and CEO of the Mermaid Arts Centre, Julie Callagher. Welcome to the show, Leon and Julie. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Joining Leon and Julie, we are delighted to welcome back Maisie Collin and, of course, Emmett. Thanks for sticking around, guys. I hope you're ready to get stuck in. We have one big, possibly contentious motion to debate for your viewing pleasure this evening. And please do remember to add your two cents in the comments below. We want to hear your views and opinions, too. A word of warning to all, as this is a show made by theatre makers for theatre makers, we have a habit of simply agreeing with each other. Therefore, I may be playing devil's advocate and taking a contrary point of view just to keep things interesting. After all, we do love a bit of drama yet, don't we? So let's get to it. Creating new work, where should the support come from? We all want to make new work and we all need somewhere to make it. Today, we are looking at the role of venues and institutions in supporting and facilitating the creation of new work. What are the obligations or responsibilities which can be reasonably expected of institutions and venues versus artists themselves? And when such supports and schemes do exist, what are the pros and cons? Big questions. Julie, I'm going to come to you first, if that's okay. What do you think is a reasonable expectation from venues and institutions in terms of facilitating or supporting artists? Um, well, I suppose it, venues and institutions aren't a homogenous group, you know, so so the kind of the, the models or the matrix of support will vary from, from place to place. Um, like it was interesting to think about when Emmett mentioned Evening Train there um, a little bit earlier on. So that was a musical that The Everman produced in collaboration with McFlannery. Um, that we didn't have any public funds to make um, and one of the reasons that we were able to do it was like you know we, we had enough comfort to take the risk on it but also because the everyman had has 650 seats or at least in non-covid times had 650 seats so you know we had a reasonable expectation of selling x number of tickets and being able to earn on the box office um 
you know, a venue like Mermaid couldn't really hope to do uh, something like that because, you know, we're, we're limited. We have about a third of the number of seats again in, in kind of COVID time. So, um, so a different kind of uh, matrix around the kind of levels of support. So this is, I mean, I'm talking about like money now, but, you know, that that's not the only support that exists as well. Um, but yeah, so it's, but that's just to illustrate that it will vary from, from place to place, you know, um, what that looks like. Um, and I suppose, you know, you also have, you know, for example, at Mermaid, we don't have an in-house producer or someone who that a dedicated role around that in the way that, say, other producing houses do. So, you know, I'm kind of Swiss Army, I think, slightly like around the kind of support that we're offering to, to artists, um, which is maybe like not the most effective thing uh you know like in a kind of urgent moment maybe you can you can do the thing that's necessary but maybe uh, uh, in the kind of longer run it can be a bit trickier i think certainly so of course you made a very good point there julie we can't compare like for like when it comes to venues and institutions but leon i'd like to ask you the same question bearing that in mind that you can't compare like for like what are the sort of reasonable expectations from venues and institutions when it comes to supporting new work in your opinion um I kind of would like to flip that on its head and think about what are the expectations of the artists. I think um, over the last year, I've been thinking a lot about this and I know a lot of other people have as well, of just that relationship between venue and artist um, and independent artist, and how um, I suppose we're coming from a, a, a long lived system that is quite, um, old fashioned in some ways, you know, whether or not we we like it or not. I think there's quite a sort of um, uh, patriarchal, for want of a better word, system in the sense that there are gatekeepers um, who may or may not feel like they are gatekeepers. And then there are individual artists who are trying to get their work made by working with those gatekeepers and hoping that the gate gatekeepers like their work and, and feel like they want to support them. Um, so I suppose I'm interested now in working out how artists take the power. And it, I suppose it goes a little bit back to some of the conversation that was happening earlier around unions, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is really um, important moment. Like it's not, I don't think it's surprising that those kind of things are, are coming to the fore now after that year of, of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I'm sort of interested in hearing more from artists and people who would like to be artists, uh, what they would like um, to be happening in their local art centres uh, and how they would like to be supported. I know that's kind of turned your question around, sorry. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fantastic. That's exactly what we're looking for here, Liam, so thank you. And on that note, um, actually building on what you've just said, Maisie, I'm going to, or Liam, I'm going to come to you, Maisie. Um, Leon spoke there about kind of empowering the artists and sometimes there are these gatekeepers. In your experience, what are the limitations when you are one of those artists kind of trying to break down those doors and get that access? What are the limitations as in your experience that exist? Yeah, I think, you know, beyond applying for project awards in the Arts Council, you know, which is often the first kind of step, I think there's different there's different ways and means and forms, and I feel like in this last year or not year and a half now, um, there's a lot of uh, venues and organisations do seem to, without having as much live theatre and live performance, kind of been rethinking how they can support artists. And you know, I think Liam makes a very good point that that may not always fit all artists, but it does feel that there's been more opportunities in the form of things like residencies. Um, where you know you can pitch an idea yes there's still a gatekeeper but it's quite open then you know the support that you're asking for from within a venue and i've been very lucky recently to be a recipient of two residencies so i've had a long-term three of three years now residency with backstage theater in longford um who've been hugely supportive and it's been very open so i've done various projects including creating a new piece for young audiences which was supposed to be on last year and then this year, and hopefully we'll be on touring uh, in May next year. Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
again, the supports offered there were hugely kind of open. It was it was what we needed. So we were given time and space and money and resources for me to bring other artists in to work with. So it's a collaboration with playwright Fanula Gigax. Uh, and um, and then on the back of a, a very successful kind of work in progress in my first year of my residency, um, Mona uh, Considine, the um, director of Backstage then took on the role. She applied as part of her her uh, grant to then produce the tour for us, which is as a freelance artist, like I couldn't ask for more to have somebody else produce it for me. That's the bit that I don't want to do and I can't do and I'm not very good at. I'd like to make the work and then somebody else to do all of that bit. So I feel like something like that is a really useful support and. There, there are different ways that residencies can work, but I think having that kind of producery support and head and financial head can be really useful for artists to just not have to worry so much about that aspect. So can I, um, just going to stick with you, Maisie, for a moment, just to pick up on Leanne's comment about um, the artist having the power. How, how do you view that point of view, Maisie? Like, do you, do you feel as an artist that you do have that power, that it should be on you to create those opportunities or to make those opportunities happen? Um, yes, yeah, I do. I mean, I think I, I definitely would much rather that the ideas and the, the genesis of things came from me rather than feeling like I have to fit into a box or tick a box, which I often do feel with Arts Council applications, where it's actually of less so with some of the other residency um, kind of venue-based opportunities. More recently, they're mu they seem to be much more open to kind of, you know, what's your idea, what do you need from us, um, rather than, you know, having to be innovative, experimental, whatever, tick all the Arts Council boxes that you have to on the forms. Um, so, yes, I do. I feel like, you know, potentially, even though you are working alongside gatekeepers in a different way as, as Leanne said I feel like working with venues and institutions can you know in some instances give more power to the artist than I solely rely on the arts council funding. Absolutely. Uh, working in such things can can really be a step forward and a gateway. I know, Colin, you worked a lot with Fish Amble early on in your career. How important was that support to you in your career? Uh, hugely. Um, I mean I wouldn't have a career um, to the extent that I do have one uh, without Fish Amble. Um, and, um, you know, it was an interesting, I suppose, example of, of, of you know, in, in terms of gatekeepers, like they are a gatekeeper, but but they keep the gate pretty wide open. Um, and they've been um, very good for a long time at fairly regularly casting the net out wide um, and calling for tiny plays or <clears throat> whatever it is. It was, it was the tiny plays that I came in under. Um, you yeah, know, that was a, that was a competition for six hundred word plays um, almost ten years ago. I wrote one, <clears throat> you know, um, that went on. I got a, <clears throat> a shot of confidence from that, um, and I came back to them with a with 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 an idea to develop the one I'd written, and it, it's the relationship has kind of gone from there. And and the crucial apart from apart from the, the most obvious thing of the work getting on and getting paid for the work, um, but the other thing that's it, crucial there is the relationship. Uh, and just being able to, if you have an idea, uh, instead of worrying about how you fit it into the form or tick the boxes, the first thing I can do is 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 have a chat, um, and and so that's that's that that's incredibly valuable. And I, I've had a good relationship um, over the last year uh, or so with Axis because I got one of their assemble bursaries. And I think that was a really interesting scheme because the monetary value of it was was relatively small. The 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 bureaucracy was almost zero. Um, and um, they brought Aoife Splan Hinks in as their, their polyp literary manager. And she very easily and quickly kind of created a bit of a community. So, um, you know, the money obviously helps. I mean, that's the first thing, I suppose. Um, but the support also and the endorsement uh, was all there as well. And I thought it was a really interesting model um, that other, other companies and, and institutions and venues could use. Absolutely. I'd like to um, touch, uh, come back to you, Julie, and just touch on the Transform Scheme at Mermaid Arts Centre. Just kind of on that topic, I mean, I, I spoke to Emmett kind of joking earlier that the competition must have been mighty. I mean, what was the application numbers for th that, that scheme? For four spots. Um, so it was 
incredibly steep and Liam will speak to this as well because she was really helpful and worked through some of the selection process with us as well. Um, so the need was enormous and it, it's, it was very challenging to, to make decisions about, you know, um, you know, who to, to, to work with when there was so much need, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, this, some, some of the thinking around Transform was completely inspired by a scheme um, that Leon devised with Mermaid, with my predecessor, Neil O'Donnell. Um, and I remember seeing some of the, the kind of feedback that came out of that scheme, which, you know, so much was about um, things like solidarity and support and community and endorsement or validation. Um, so I suppose Transform is trying to maybe step that up, you know, a, across a kind of a longer uh, yeah, period of time, basically. Certainly. So, Lena, I'm going to come to you now. Uh, thank you, Julie, for teeing that up beautifully for me. What does that say? The fact that there was clearly such a need and such a want and a desire for this scheme, what does that tell us about the state of where we are at at the moment? I know pandemic notwithstanding, I think we can all agree that there were huge issues in our industry previous to that. So what does that say about where we're at and how can we take this fantastic scheme and bring it further afield? Should everywhere be offering things like this? Mm -hmm. I'd love if everywhere offered something like that. I mean, I think it's um, one of the most exciting things about it. And Emmett kind of touched on it earlier is that it's an opportunity for the artists to change the organisation as much as it is for the artists to learn about the organisation. And I think that's really key. I'm, I'm, as you can tell, all for trying to find ways of giving artists more power because I think they don't have enough at the moment. Um, but the scheme that Julie was talking about just there uh, that I worked on and, and will continue to work on with um, Mermaid is called Gap Days. And it was, it's a program which is very, uh, when I was first asked to invent something for it, um, I thought at the time, this is, you know, I can't even remember, six, seven years ago, maybe, I thought at the time, what do I need? I just need a day where I don't feel guilty for taking time, quote, off to go back through my journals, my my notes, to do the kind of things that I've been putting off that will feed me creatively, but that I endlessly say, oh, I'll do it a day, you know, where I don't have to work. And I don't, you know, I don't want to feel guilty for taking time off work to do that. And it's yeah. unsurprisingly been hugely successful. It's a really tiny, tiny offer. It's one or two days um, of paid time for, for theatre artists to do the work, whatever it is they need to do in a local art centre to them. And we facilitate the introduction with the local art centre. And the kind of feedback that we got from the very, very beginning kind of blew me away because I've sat on a lot of our application processes over the years where there's a bit of jazz hands going on, where people are saying, pick me, pick me, I'm a great artist, I will do um, a great job, you know, I've done all this wonderful stuff and I'm absolutely reliable and all this other stuff. And the gap day program was kind of not the opposite, but it was just very real, the applications we were getting in, where people were saying, I really need a day because I am, you know, a single parent, I'm taking care of my pa aging parents, I'm living in a house with five other people and I only get to work at the kitchen table after everybody's gone to bed. I'm working four jobs, whatever it is. It was just the reality of people's lives. And also what I always think of is embarrassingly, when people got it, they get one or two days, which is maybe 200 or 400 euros worth of support. But the amount of gratitude and positivity that people got out of that did kind of embarrass me because I was like, God, are people really are artists really struggling so much that 200 euros and a bit of a, yeah, well done, you're, you're actually an artist, congratulations, from somebody that they probably have never met before, me, uh, really goes such a long way. So for me, it was really upsetting actually to see that that's got such a big impact on, on theatre artists. Um, so yeah, more, more schemes like this, but more schemes like this that allow the artists to do the things that they want to do rather than in any way sort of directing them into something that the organisations want them to do. Certainly, and staying with that idea of empowering artists, um, there, in recent times there has been a lot of talk and discussion here at Theatre Maker and on Twitter and everywhere about 
how hard it can be to say no to things that the pace of work, especially right now, it feels is ridiculous. I mean, we all learned so much in the last year and then everybody pressed go at the same time and it's getting a little bit nuts. So is that idea of things like, you know, gap days and easing off pressure maybe on expectation, is that a way that venues can can be supporting artists in a very real way? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, even just in the last 24 hours, you know, um, that amazing Simone Biles has just stepped away from her Olympics uh, activity for her own mental health. I think that's a really important thing to take notice of. Um, the fact that we do need to take time for ourselves, that we need to be able to say it ourselves like we need to be able to stand up for our own mental health and our own our own other lives that are outside of work and i think that the organizations we're working with have to encourage that actually and and let people know that that's okay that's an okay way to work that if you want to say actually i can only do four days a week and i can't do any more than that but within those four days i'll work my ass off and i'll I'll get the work done, but I just don't want to do five days a week because it's going to kill me. Or I just don't want to work weekends. You know, this whole thing of rehearsing five days a week and a half day on Saturday, like, where has that come from? And really, do people really need to do that? You know, they've got other lives. We've all learned how important it is to be at home. We've all learned the kind of the connections with our families and with our neighborhoods out of the last couple of years. And I, for one, definitely want to be able to keep that going in a way that keeps my personal life enriched. Um, and I don't want my work life encroaching on that so much. So, you know, I'm lucky enough to be at a point in my life, in my career where I am. I feel like I'm able to say that. I know a lot of other people aren't. So I think it would be great if, or if organizations led on that and said, it is okay to give us your Tell us your limitations, you know, for you to put limits on your work. Yes, yeah, certainly. We're aware that you've been quite vocal on this topic. We actually featured one of your tweets on this um, as a jumping off point for one of our debates a few weeks ago. Just about everybody kind of remembering to breathe and slow down and to try and remember all the learning that we've had in the last year. Emmett, I'm going to come to you now. Do you ever feel like there is a them versus us culture when it comes to freelancers and those in employment? And if so, how do you think we can all work together to improve that? Um, I, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure. I'm not. I genuinely don't know the answer to that. Like, I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't. I think if everybody's kind of working in the arts, I don't think people are really. They're just kind of trying to make what they want to make. You know what I mean? Hoping that they can get it done. You know what I mean? So I don't really think there's any animosity between between the two. You know, I think there's more solidarity amongst most artists. You know. Um, yeah, sorry, I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> That's okay, we're not expecting um, uh, per perfect answers. Maisie, what's your, do you, have you ever experienced that where you felt there's like a them versus us kind of a culture? Um, I think less so. There did used to be a while where I know, you know, there was some tweets going around just about how long it sometimes takes for invoices to be paid and for um, organizations to not always realize that you know that might literally be somebody's rent that freelance artists you know being paid quickly with is really really valuable um but i feel like things have begun to improve in that way um you know and and i, I kind of yeah i feel like that within the industry anyway in the last while it feels that there is more solidarity hopefully come through covid that we are all in this together even if some of us get paid through invoicing uh, and some of us get paid a salary. You know, I, we're all on the same team. Certainly, I, and I will take this moment to say that in all our debates and discussions that we've had on Stage Door Live in the last number of weeks, the one message that keeps coming up again and again and again, no matter, no matter the topic, is that we all need to work together and that we are all on the same team. So it's lovely that that's what everybody is saying, regardless that we should be working together. Julie, I'm going to come back to you now. Taking everything that we've claimed to learn in the last year and the dawn of schemes like Transform, and the potential of UBI dangling before us, possibly. What do you envision as the ideal practical path forward for this industry in the support of our artists and art workers? 
like I'm very excited by the possibilities that basic income can offer. Um, I'd be I'd be maybe take a slightly more pessimistic view about um, you know division in the sector uh, because I think the power bal- imbalances are really real and even if people don't like to or aren't in a position to name them I think they exist actually and I think we've got to I think we have a lot of work to do actually to sort of um, get really uncomfortable with all of that and uh, to try and get out the other side of it really Um, so I think for me it's about um, in terms of path forward it's a about kind of kind of holding space for that discomfort you know for those of us who are gatekeepers who are also artists who aren't able to practice who you know like you know, there's kind of like all sorts of layers in all sorts of ways around those things um but uh yeah so so yeah that's the thing that i'm really interested in is about is about creating that space i think this is a really interesting space to have those conversations i think your local art centers are really interesting places to have those conversations and that you know i would love love to see um to see more artists having i don't know just be able to kind of hang out <laughs> like for us to see each other and kind of shoot the shit a little bit you know um because it often you know our culture is very on you know like it's like you know what's happening what's next what are you doing you know like i'd like to be I have a space where it's like not what are you doing but like what are you thinking about actually <laughs> you know yeah certainly i think there can often be a fear especially for those of us who are less established and wouldn't necessarily have the security there's often a fear of saying the wrong thing or rubbing the wrong person up the wrong way and that's very very real um, and uh, it, it can be quite tricky to overcome. So, Leon, I'm going to give you the final word on the same point. How do we practically do that? How do we make sure that we are, you know, having these difficult conversations, that it's safe for us to have these conversations with those people? What are the steps that should be taken, do you think, moving forward? Well, I think, um, Julie, following on as well from what Julie just said, my first step in anything where I feel like there's a difficult conversation or I feel like maybe something hasn't been addressed that I'd like to address is to find my peers and to, you know find the people who are around me who maybe start are thinking similarly to me um, and to start having conversations with them. I think that's one of the great difficulties um, in the last year is that we've been so isolated. However, one of the great things is that we are now more able to connect across the country than we ever were before, or at least than we realized we could have been before. Um, So I feel like finding people to talk to in the first instance, like finding other artists to talk to if you're an artist, if you're an artist at a certain point in your career, finding um, other artists like you to talk to, um, and just starting conversations. I think starting honest, open conversations and asking questions of people is always good. It's always positive, but it's always good to have somebody with you who you feel like has your back. Um, I'm always up for conversations with people if anybody ever wants one. Um, (laughs) But I know people like Julie as well. And, you know, a lot of people who run art centers are also open for conversations with artists at all stages of their careers. So to to get in touch with people. They are humans, you know, they're behind organizations, but they are humans and they've got a huge amount of love for what they do and for the artists. So yeah, find your peers, talk to them, get a bit of, I don't know, uh, confidence up and go and, and ask a question of your local arts organization. Brilliant. Some very fantastic practical advice there to end on. I agree completely. And though there is no doubt in my mind that this is a debate that's far from over, we're going to have to keep having these conversations. I'm afraid that is all we have time for. But before we go really quickly, we've only about two minutes. Um, Colin, I'm going to start with you. What is, are there any projects or things coming up that you'd like people to know about? Uh, next one for me is a play, a new play with Fishamble uh, towards the end of the year, November, December, called The Treaty, set in Downing Street during the negotiations of the 1921 Anglo-Irish Treaty. So that'll be on the Fishamble website, fishamble.com, in the coming months. Fantastic. Maisie, same question to you? 
Um, I have two audio pieces actually coming up. Um, so a piece for Babaro, the Children's Festival in Galway in uh, October, and then a piece with the Abbey as part of a series they're doing in I think, November, December. And then hopefully the tour of the piece that I mentioned for, uh, will be touring the country next May, fingers crossed. Brilliant. Julie, is there anything in particular that you'd like to let people know that's happening at Mermaid or elsewhere at the moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm just about to, to go out the door to go down to the seafront on Bray for a dry run of a show that's opening here next week. It's called Of A Mind and it's made by a company called Listen and Breathe. So it's an audio experience that will take hopefully up to 50 people uh, on a, a guided audio tour around Bray Seafront and it's running from the 4th uh, uh, of August to the 15th. So come to Bray to see us. That sounds beautiful and what a lovely place to be, especially when there is nice weather. Uh, Leon, is there anything that you'd like to let people know about? Sure, um, I'm working on many things at once, uh, but in terms of the theatre aspect of things, the few things coming up for the rest of the year for me is I'm working with uh, This Is Pop Baby on the playwright sessions that you mentioned earlier. So they're looking for um, playwrights in Ireland and Irish playwrights abroad to give them some ideas uh, so that we can shape the year's worth of sessions. Um, Gap Days is going to come back, I am glad to say. So that'll be open later in the year. And also the Pam Pam Mentorship, which I've run uh, for nearly 10 years now, is going to go into its ninth iteration and we'll open applications for that in October. And I'm delighted to say that the mentor who was the mentor this year, who's Terry O'Connor from Forced Entertainment, is going to be continuing as our mentor for next year because we thought we could squeeze a bit more out of her. Fantastic. Some great opportunities for viewers there. And in the interest of fairness, Emmett, would you like to remind everyone what your next project is before we go? Oh, yeah. Uh, straight to video. Uh, sell, sell, sell. Tickets on sale now. <laughs> it's coming <laughs> in November. Yeah. And, uh, it's set in a video shop in West Halla in 1996. So it's, um, it's That's a, a good year. Growing. What's that? <laughs> That's a good year, 1996. <laughs> It's, it's the best year. It's the best year to <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to all our guests for joining us this evening. Maisie, Colin, Emmett, Julie and Liam. It has been an absolute pleasure chatting with all of you. And I do hope that you'll come back again soon. Friends, viewers, Fellow makers, lend me your ears. I come not to beg charity, but rather to seek support. We here at Theatre Maker love bringing you all of the latest news, debates and topics related to Irish theatre and the arts. Since April 2020, we have worked tirelessly creating content on our website, social media and YouTube channel, building a platform where artists and art workers can share their work and let their voices be heard on the topics that matter most. We've been privileged to share so many stories and facilitate discussions with all of you, and we care very deeply about the work we've been doing. However, nothing in this world comes entirely for free, though we are incredibly grateful to everyone who has supported and helped us along the way, our Patreon community, Dublin City Council, and of course, Axis Ballymun, the truth is, even with that support, everyone on this team is working voluntarily, pooling our own resources into Theatre Maker every month to make it happen. As our residency with Axis will soon be coming to an end, we are reaching a point where we must roll up our sleeves, square our shoulders, lift our chins and ask for your help and support. After all, to quote the great bird once again, if money go before, always do lie open. We understand that not everyone is in a position to sign up to be a patron. And so for the entire month of August, we will be actively fundraising to keep the conversations going at Theatre Maker. Of course, we do not expect something for nothing. We've quite a few fun events planned. So please keep an eye out across all our socials and YouTube for the impending madness. As we have created an entirely new thing, we do not currently fit into any existing funding streams. We are working hard with some brilliant people to figure this out. But in the meantime, we really do need your help. We know from your feedback that what we're doing is important and enjoyable and even entertaining. So please do consider a one-off donation when the time comes and help keep the conversation going. 
After all, no profit grows where no pleasure is taken. I had to get one last quote in there. Points if you can guess the plays in the comments. That's it for me. Ihua, August Fonslan.